Good morning.
Come on up. <laughs>
Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners do, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on the law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaves does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Now please hear the scripture lesson from the book of Job, chapter 42. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, Who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, Listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, but my eyes have seen you. Lord God, again, we name before you our gratitude for giving us the gift of this time together, for the gift of your word, the gift of your Holy Spirit. God, we ask that you would make use of this time. We ask that you would allow us to hear what you have to say to us, and that you would speak through your spirit right into our lives. We ask that you would help me to think and to speak clearly. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Two stories for you. The first one, an incredible, astonishing news story came across uh, the news feed this week on Wednesday. On Wednesday, two women were picked up from sea, from a ship on sea, about 900 miles east of Japan. Two women who had been at sea since the beginning of May and who were finally rescued, alive, safe and sound, and their two dogs as well. These two women left from Hawaii in the beginning of May, experienced sailors, saying, we're going to go on a lovely uh, sail down to Tahiti. I had to look up where Tahiti is, by the way. Like, everybody's heard of Tahiti. Who knows where Tahiti is? Like, off the top of their head. Anybody? <laughs> yeah, anybody who said, I don't know. So, so, basically, here's Australia, and like, there's French Polynesia, and it's like down to the right on the map, okay? So they're going roughly south, about 2,000 miles. Experienced sailors, they say, you know, we know it's going to take us about two months, but being experienced, we're going to bring enough dry goods for a year, and we're going to bring enough dog food as well uh, for that same amount of time, and we're going to bring a water purifier, even though we have plenty of water, but we're experienced sailors, and it's going to be lovely going from Hawaii to Tahiti. I mean, what kind of life is that? Sounds really good. Anyway, so they get on the boat, and it, it, the ship, and it's wonderful, and they have a motor, and they have a GPS, and they have communication, and everything's perfect. And it's sunny, and it's nice breezes, and great. And then there's a storm. Pretty big storm. And it knocks out part of their steering system. The motor of the boat no longer functions. And the capstone is that they lose their communication ability. They no longer have their GPS functioning. They're not able to be in touch with anybody. And they say to each other, we're experienced sailors. We have enough food for a year. We're going to be fine. We have some understanding of the way the ocean currents go and the way that you know we can still sail, we can still navigate, and, and as a backup, we have this emergency radio signal that we can, you know, use that in the middle of the ocean right now. But we could, we could use it, and that could work. So they're hopeful, and they put up the sail, and they start to go, and 
you know, as it turns out, the ship is still seaworthy, but just uh, not going the way that it should go. Some of its navigation um, instruments are, are, um, are broken. So they go on a month and two months and into the third month, and they are not where they think that they should be in by now. They've seen nothing. They've seen no one. It, it didn't, the news story didn't say this, but I wonder how much they fought. Like, you think you'd start to fight, you know, because you only have one other person to talk to. You're probably really glad for the dog. They <laughs> suffered two sharp attacks, tiger sharks, ramming the hull of the boat. Can you imagine this? It's a true story. And finally they start to realize that maybe they need to send out a distress signal. That maybe this isn't going the way that they had hoped, even given the situation. So they send out a radio distress signal. How far does radio station go? Do you know? You drive up into New Hampshire. I listen to WBUR. I love listening to WBUR. And I'm off 93 and I'm in New Hampshire and all of a sudden, zzz, zzz, right? I have to change the channel, find the people. NPR or New Hampshire or whatever, right? How far is that? 30 miles? They send out the radio signal, 30 miles. Nothing. Well, maybe tomorrow. Send it out again. Maybe tomorrow. Nothing. Nothing. As it turns out, they are in the absolute middle of nowhere. Nobody goes to this spot in the ocean. Nobody can hear their distress signal. They sent out distress signals for 98 days. And nobody heard them. And they started to fear for their lives. Now they knew the way the ocean currents go. They knew a lot of facts and figures about how much food they have and how seaworthy their craft is and all these things. They have a lot of information. But none of that is comforting them. The thing that brings comfort to them is on day number 98, when they send out that distress signal, a Japanese fishing boat hears them because now they are closer to Japan than to Australia. And the Japanese fishing boat sees them and is not as a small craft, can't help them, can't tow the boat, calls the US Navy and the Navy picks them up. The thing that brought them comfort when they sent out their distress signal wasn't facts or figures or information about where they were located. It was a human voice that came back across that ocean. Story number two. We've all been in this story. You know this story. Which role did you play in this story? You think about it, because you may have played multiple roles in this one. So it's the middle of the night. It's about 11.34 p.m., perhaps. And all of a sudden, crash, boom! Thunderstorm right overhead, and your eyes are wide open, right? Wide open. Thunderstorm is right there, and you think, oh, okay, okay. Let's go back to the Boom! Oh, man, it is right here. Like, you're, like, looking out the window. You're trying to see. Did that just hit that tree over there, right? The storm is right there. And if you have little kids, you know what's next, right? Bitter cat, bitter cat. Mama, 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 I can't sleep. The storm won't be up. I'm so scared. Go back to bed. No sympathy at 11.34 p.m. Go back to bed. Okay, okay. I will go with you. And so you go into the bedroom and you put the kid back in the bed. Boom! Right there. Oh my gosh, it's really loud. We have skylights in the bedrooms upstairs. Thumbs down. Really bad for lightning storms. Okay. And you pull the covers up and and you put your hand on the kid's back and you say, you know, this is going to be all right. Crash! Boom! But it's so loud. Why does the lightning have to be so bright and the thunder have to be so loud? It's so scary. And you think to yourself, well, here's a teachable moment. I am a good parent and I will now elucidate my child on physics and lightning and thunder. And so you go into this long, interesting, fascinating speech about, you know, the release of energy when the clouds hit each other and light traveling faster than sound and honey and grass, boom, and it's shaking and you rub the back of the one. You know, and, and, and now we can tell that the storm is starting to move away because we can count the seconds and the sound goes about a mile in a second. And well, just spouting forth this wonderful wisdom, trying to help this child. And after a little while, the seconds in between
moving and lightning and thunder grow and the storm is moving off and the kid is getting droopy and you are getting droopy. You can tell who I identify with the story. Though I've been in the bed too. And so you pat the kid one more time on the back and you go back to bed. Next morning, the kid's downstairs at the island eating uh, breakfast cereal and daddy says, you woke up during the storm, didn't you? Daddy knows about the science education that has happened last night. Yes, I did wake up during the storm. What did mommy tell you about the storm? And the kid says, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but mommy sat in my bed and she rubbed my back and she made me feel better. In the middle of a storm, the thing that brings us comfort is the voice of someone else on the other end of the line in the middle of the storm. The thing that brings us comfort, not facts and figures and science, is a hand on the back sitting on the bed and saying, I'm here. Job, not Job, Job, knew something about storms. I read a little bit of it to the kids. It's um, interesting to, if you, if you want to get into an interesting debate with pastors, you can talk about whether or not Job actually happened or if it's more of like a myth. Why do bad things happen to good people? Job is demonstrably a good person. It even says in the beginning of the book that God said Job was a good person. This was a nice guy who did great things, who worked hard, and who loved God. And in one day, his whole fortune is wiped out, and his children are killed. In one day. And after that, his skin breaks out, and he's miserable and itchy, and sitting there with no money, and grieving the loss of his children, and in physical pain. In one day. You want to talk about a storm. He sends out a distress signal and his friends come and they sit right next to him on the ground. I love that. Sit on the ground. Sit right next to him. And they say nothing for a week because what can you say? They did that really well. But after a week goes by, now they've been thinking, see, and they know lots of facts and details and theology about God. And they're wise men and have lots of information. And they think, let's solve this problem, Job. Because Job has just been sitting there saying, why? They say, you know, I've been thinking about why, Job. And I may have some answers and some reasoning here for you. And so they start to speak to him. And they say, well, Job, one of them says, obviously, Job, you're a screw-up. God's punishing you. Don't you see? You just need to repent. How comforting is that? They should have kept quiet, right? <laughs> And another one says, well, Job, you know, it's got to be this. And they go on and on and on with information and true things, actually sound theology. Maybe not the one about you being a jerk, not that one. But some true observations about God, not comforting the least, but still true. And they talk and they talk and they talk and they share all this information. And Job listens to them and thinks, man, with friends like these, like, <laughs> this is terrible. And he says, you guys, you've got it all wrong. Let me tell you what's going on with me. And then Job starts to talk. And he says, again, so many realities of his life and the details and, and, and his relationship with God and how he's never done anything wrong. And then he starts talking to God. And he says, God, you know that this is true and you know about me. And he calls God on the carpet and he says, where do you get away treating me like this? I've been a good guy this whole time. You shouldn't be punishing me. I've done nothing wrong, God. And he goes on and on and on and words and words and words for 20, 38 chapters. <laughs> this is a long book. Can I just have a sidebar here for a minute because we've got some time. I did learn that sidebar is a legal term. Okay. I tell the lawyer. Yeah. You can actually stand for stuff. I have a friend who's having a hard time in life, and she says, well, now I'm going to start reading my Bible, right? Because my life, maybe I need to get closer to God. So she uses the time on her technique of going like this. Oh, look. <laughs> That's how I write. She's opening it right now. And she opened to Job in those 38 chapters of Job going, why was I even born? I shouldn't have been born. You shouldn't do this. You want to get closer to God, and here I'm reading, I shouldn't have even been born. Don't start with Job, okay? <laughs> Job is like 301 level, 401 level. It's not intro, not one level. Job goes on and on and on, words and words and words. And finally, in chapter 38, it says, 
And then God answered Job. God answered Job. How many times have you poured out your heart to God saying, why, 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 why? And wanted to get an answer. Wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to have an answer to why your friend died at 47 from cancer with four little kids? Wouldn't it be wonderful to have an answer for a parent who sees their child just spiraling out of control with bad decisions? Wouldn't it be wonderful to have an answer why you lose your son so young? Right? Sorry. I can look at all of you and I can say, I would love to have an answer. It would be so great to say, God, give me an answer. And God would just respond. And God did. He did. Job sent on his distress signal. And finally, God gave the word back. Interesting, though. When God gives the word back, it isn't the answer that Job's looking for. It isn't two plus two equals four, and therefore that's why you have four things. It's not that kind of answer. God starts to talk about who God is and says, I'm the one who made this whole universe. I'm the one who put the stars in the sky. I'm the one who stretched out the neck of the ostrich. I'm the one who stores the snow over there and I'm the one who puts the fish in the sea. I'm the one who made all of this. I understand and my ability and imagination and scope is so huge, Job. And you are like this. You are like this. You can't understand. I cannot tell you. So God answers. The voice comes back. But doesn't say why. But maybe that's not the point anyway. Maybe the point is the relationship that God was listening and that God was talking. Maybe the point is sitting next to somebody. The relationship rather than a correct answer. Yes, the storm is real and it is really scary and that's true. But maybe the most important thing about the storm is that you are so aware that God is with you because of the storm, because you need that so much at that time. And God speaks and God answers. You know, Jesus and the disciples were in a storm too, in a boat. Kind of like the guy, the lady there. Um, they were in a storm. And famously, Jesus is snoozing in the front of the boat, right? And it's like crash, boom, and waves, and terrible, and the GPS breaks down. Let's put all the illustrations together, and it all works um, here. And the disciples wake him, wake him up and say, Jesus, ah, we're so scared, we're going to die, we're going to lose our life. And Jesus is not mad at them for being scared, or for looking at the storm and saying, that's a very real storm, this is a serious situation. That's correct. Jesus is good. That's fine. But he is disappointed with them that they could fear for their lives when he is right next to them. That's why he says that they have little faith. Because he is right next to them. And better than having all the right answers about how thunder and lightning works is having a relationship with God intact and so close. So three takeaways for us. The first one, um, I sort of wish that I hadn't learned. <laughs> I feel like I've learned it in the last year or so. Um, but when we see that storm coming, sometimes we have advanced warning on storms, right? Like, uh, just my quickest example here is our friend Hugh, when we found out our friend Hugh was sick. And you can see it coming, and you can say, wow, this loved one has cancer, and this loved one is going to die soon. And I can see the storm, and I can see it's coming towards me, and I know that that's going to be a rough one, right? It's coming. But the first thing is that when we can see the suffering coming, we can see the storm coming, as we mature in our faith, we can say, okay, God, this is a chance for me and you, friend. This is a chance for me to mature. This is a chance for me to grow in trust. And we can look at that storm and say, this is an opportunity as a person of faith. And I know it's going to sting. It's not like there's not very real lightning and thunder happening. 
Like, that's a reality. It doesn't take away the difficulty of it. But you can say, okay, God, we're going to go through this together. I think we're going to be stronger. I'm going to be stronger in my faith when we get through it. So we can look at the storm and the suffering, whatever it is, and say, this is good. <laughs> oh, this is good. Right? It's going to bring me closer to that. Takeaway number two. Um, we don't always get answers to why bad things happen. Um, we aren't going to know that necessarily. And let us be okay with that. Let us remember the scope that God is. I mean, especially another way you can translate what God said to Job was God said, sit down. Don't you know who I am? It's a little tough when someone's suffering to speak to them that way. But you don't call me on the carpet is what God said. I, I made all this. You're like this. Again, a tough posture for someone who's suffering. But that's okay to not have those answers, but instead to have a God who's willing to speak to us, who's willing to be with us in that boat, in that storm. And the last takeaway. So suffering matures us. We're not going to get all the answers. It's not why we're here. It's not why we're Christians to have all the answers to everything. It's to have a relationship. And the third thing is that this is helpful to us when we see our friends who are going through difficult times, and they look to us as people of faith, and they say, you know, how does this work? Like, I don't even get this. I, I'm suffering so much. It's got to be all right. And then you feel like, oh, I need to now defend my faith. I need to give the right answer. I need to say the perfect word. Who has had the perfect word to say when somebody suffers? Anybody? Because it's not me, right? <laughs> that perfect response. We search for it. We just want to have those right words. Can we let ourselves off the hook from that? Can we say, this isn't about having that perfect right response, but it is about sitting down next to the person and being with them, being in the boat with them, and saying, um, I love you, and God loves you, and God's here. Right? You don't have to have the answer. Thank goodness. But you can sit with them. And you can embody that kind of compassion and that love and reality of God to them in that moment. So the book of Job is about suffering that we cannot explain. It's about searching for answers that aren't given. But it's about a God that is in relationship with us, who answers us when we send that distress signal and comes to sit with us and be with us. And love us. Amen. Time for our offering. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you for letting us know that that you are there listening and that you are ready to respond. Thank you for helping us to navigate the storms of life because you are with us. Please receive this offering as an expression of our gratitude. We ask that you would bless and multiply it to your service in the world. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
church fair is a week from yesterday. Dee, you are looking remarkably calm there in the back. Good for you. Do you have an announcement at all? Is there anything else that we need to know, any support that you need um, regarding the church fair? Um, I'll be here Friday at noon from noon to 7. People want to drop off big goods, help bag and tag big goods, set up, and then we'll kick off Saturday morning. Two kids are starting to survive. Anybody volunteering and wants to help. But um, we have a Facebook announcement on the church page. So if you're on Facebook, Go to the page, indicate that you are attending, and then share that announcement on your own page. Let's get the word out so that we're so busy we might not have everything. All right. Uh, yes, yeah, so. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we got on our phones and did a little Facebooking for people who do that. But if you would, there is an invitation on Facebook. It's a great way to share the information. It's on the Aldersgate uh, Facebook page. And you just go click, and it goes boom to all your, your friends. So thank you for your leadership, Dee. Uh, Pastor Johnson wanted me to announce uh, that the Church of All Nations, which has been meeting here for a couple years now, has had their first uh, death. Um, and so that's sort of a milestone for him. He's having a memorial service uh, a week from today at 3 p.m. And he wanted our church to know about it in case anybody wanted to come and support the Church of All Nations. A man named Roger Leslie uh, passed away. So that's next Sunday at 3 p.m. And tomorrow night, uh, there is the annual meeting of the church. This is called by our district superintendent. He tells us the date and time, and uh, we show up and celebrate what we've done in the last year in Aldersgate, including uh, financial and trustees information and then reports from all the ministry areas. Thank you to everybody who turned in reports to me. Uh, it is a long 34 page report. Um, and if you come, you can read it all. It's, it's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, we're gonna be meeting in the parlor tomorrow night at seven o'clock. It is an open meeting. Uh, we'll be voting on a couple of matters and most of all, just saying go God for all the good things that happened this past year. After church today, and also in two weeks, we are having a discussion group for anybody who has read Waking Up White. Um, we'll be meeting in classroom four for about an hour just to give our impressions and feedback. And it is a compelling and challenging book uh, for white folks to consider uh, white privilege and systemic racism in our country. Uh, some people don't even like hearing those words. So especially if you're among those, um, but also if you've read this, please come to the discussion group today in classroom four at the far end of the hall. Um, after church, if you see somebody that you don't know their name, will you please talk to them in the first two minutes? That's the two minute rule. Uh, go say hello and say, I don't remember your name, or have we met? And um, just for the first two minutes, and then go talk to your friends after that. And finally, uh, I think that the kids have something for us, I think. Are, are the kids? Coming? Maybe. I, I, I worked with Amanda on this, and we have substitute Amanda, so maybe it's not going to go the way that we had planned, but that is okay. All right. For celebration and thanks, um, Rachel Montez wanted to thank Sally Action uh, for sending out the Get Well cards um, that she uh, does so frequently. Sally, you are a blessing the way that you send the birthday cards and Get Well cards to people. So let's Give her a hand. Also, I want to celebrate uh, John Wise uh, leading the blood drive after being out of town all weekend and I think taking a red eye in the night before. Uh, ran the blood drive on last Monday and collected 20 uh, pints of blood. So let's celebrate John. And Norma, yes, yes, absolutely. Please stand for the benediction. May the God who answers us when we cry out, the God who sits with us, the God who has come to be with us in Jesus, be with us all until we meet again. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.